legends. The players that are remembered long after their playing days end, and indeed long after they too pass. The players that live on in mythology and reverence, that have influenced the game we see today. They are players who have set records, won championships, and captured our attention, etching their legacies into the foundations of this game. A legend is special, not simply because their talent set them apart, but because their stories transcend the individual. In fact, to me, that is what a legend is. A remarkable player who tells a story that enthralls us. So today, I'd like to talk about the legend of Bill Walton. You've seen the title. It's not clickbait, I swear. I really do think that Bill Walton is the biggest what if in NBA history. I know that the usual suspects for that designation are guys like Penny Hardaway, Derrick Rose, and Grant Hill. I know that it's hard to look at Walton's resume and think of him as a what if guy. Two time college champ, three time college player of the year, number one draft pick, two time NBA champion, finals MVP, regular season MVP, sixth man of the year, Hall of Fame, and a member of the 50th and 75th NBA anniversary teams. That's not a guy who didn't achieve. That's one of the greatest players of all time. But that is what makes him unique in this discussion. Because even with those accomplishments, Walton never got anywhere close to his potential. Let's take a look at the career totals for two centers. One is Bill Walton's. Can you guess who the other is? That's right, two-time All-Star Roy Hibbert. His numbers are weird and it hurts him historically. He gets overlooked and underappreciated. Can Walton simultaneously be underrated for the things that he accomplished and a what if for the things he wasn't able to do? If you do know anything about Walton, you know that he is weird. After his playing career ended, Walton went into broadcasting and became an Emmy award-winning color commentator who can be as articulate as he can outrageous. You probably know him from his tie-dyed shirts, his Grateful Dead references, and his uncompromising eccentricity. He's always been that way, ever since his college days as a UCLA Bruin. Bill Walton was John Wooden's easiest recruit ever. They both admit it. Walton grew up in California, a San Diego kid, and he loved it. The beach, the weather, the sunshine, the culture. Walton absorbed it all like a sponge. He was a prodigious high school standout, leading Helix High to two consecutive division titles and a 44-game win streak during his two years as a varsity starter. He drew the attention of scouts during his senior year, where he registered the highest field goal percentage and the third most rebounds in a season by any high schooler ever. His mind was made up the second he got the letter. He'd wanted to go to UCLA for as long as he could remember, and he was coming to the program at a truly historic time. The Bruins were in the midst of a dynastic run, having won championships in 1964, 5, 7, 8, 9, and 1970. Four in a row, and six in the last seven years. They won a fifth consecutive championship while he was a freshman on the junior varsity team. The expectations were high for Walton. As the top recruit in the nation, he was tasked with continuing one of the most incredible winning traditions in sports history and he didn't make things easy on himself. Like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar before him, Walton didn't always see eye to eye with Wooden, the media, or the general American public. He was a man of the times, a hippie through and through. A vegetarian, he was famously anti-Nixon and anti-war. He took an active role in his beliefs and was arrested in 72 for occupying a UCLA administrative building with a group of students in protest of the Vietnam War. John Wooden was the man who showed up and bailed him out. In his first two seasons as a starter, the Bruins win an undefeated 60-0, won two national championships, and Walton took home two National Player of the Year honors. He wasn't just a cog in the machine. He was the machine. He was enormous, listed at 6'11", but easily closer to 7'2 or 7'3", 
Walton had no holes in his game. During his time in college, he was routinely compared to three players. Wilt Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and Bill Russell. The three best centers who have ever played basketball. His defining college performance came in his junior season in the 1973 National Championship game. Looking to extend their streak of consecutive titles to seven, Bill Walton was a man possessed. He came out hot, knocking down shot after shot after shot, dooming Memphis State's title hopes with each one. The man just couldn't miss, almost literally. By the end of the game, Walton had racked up 13 rebounds and had made 21 of his 22 shots. His 44 points are still the most points any player has ever scored in the championship game. Those who were there still testify that it was the most dominant game of basketball ever played by a college athlete. Entering his senior season, Walton had upheld his end of the bargain. The best player in the country was a Bruin and UCLA had remained a powerhouse. He was elated. He took great pride in the chance to be a part of something historic. He savored the relationships that he had with his teammates and with his coach. But in a January game against Notre Dame, the Bruins faltered. They lost by one point, with Walton wearing a back brace after a hard fall the week prior. The defeat ended an 88-game win streak that will likely stand until the end of time and marked the first time that Bill Walton had lost a basketball game since his junior year of high school. Following the game, Walton ruthlessly described his own performance as a complete failure on all levels, particularly as a human being, a disgrace to the game of basketball, a disgrace to sport. It's one of the things that stands out to me about Walton. It didn't matter that he was hurt or that this was only the regular season or that this was the first time the team had lost in years. For all of his optimism and positivity and love, he was unrelenting when it came to his own shortcomings. A month later, the Bruins dropped back-to-back games. When they lost in the Final Four to David Thompson's North Carolina State team in double overtime, Walton was inconsolable. Still to this day, he calls that loss a stigma on his soul that he will never overcome. Nevertheless, he was named the Player of the Year for the third time in as many years, bringing his college basketball resume to pantheonic levels. Two national championships, two undefeated seasons, three Player of the Year awards, spearheaded an 88-game win streak, and submitted the best performance in college basketball championship history. He was a no-brainer when the Portland Trailblazers took him with the first pick in the draft. But first, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Factor. Factor is a meal delivery subscription service that literally could not make eating well any easier. Unlike other meal delivery services, Factor meals are pre-prepared, saving you the trouble of deciding what to make and the time it would take to make it. And the great thing about Factor meals is that they're never frozen and created by scratch with nutritious ingredients with registered dietitians working hand in hand with the kitchen to make sure that Factor's quality is unrivaled. Their menu is super flexible, allowing you to pick and choose how many meals and add-ons you want each week with keto, calorie smart, chef's choice, and vegan plus veggie options. They were kind enough to send me a trial box and I recorded my first time trying a meal, the red pepper queso chicken. I put it in the oven because I'm a fancy lad and was blown away. The serving size was perfect and the taste was really good. That's pretty good. I have to say, my favorite thing though was the smoothies. I don't normally eat breakfast, but these smoothies were absolutely delicious and ridiculously convenient. I cannot recommend them enough. To start with Factor, head to go.factor75.com slash Clayton120 and use code Clayton120 to get $120 off. That's go.factor75.com slash Clayton120 and use code Clayton120 to get $120 off. As a consequence of his collegiate success, Walton was expected to come into the league and immediately make an impact. And yet, for his first two years in the league, he spent nearly as much time recovering from injuries as he did playing. He only played in about half of the team's games in those first two years, dealing with injuries to his ankle, wrist, toes, fingers, leg, and feet. But things started changing in his third season. The team hired Dr. Jack Ramsey, 
a visionary head coach that was as much an idealist as he was an innovator. He thought that basketball should be played a certain way, tough, fast, and smart. The ABA had also finally merged with the NBA, allowing the Trailblazers to acquire the talents of Maurice Lucas. Mo immediately made an impact, leading the Blazers in scoring and adding 11 rebounds a night on his way to an all-star selection. He and Walton established an enduring friendship. Walton was the leader, Mo was the enforcer. As the season went along, the team improved night after night. Walton's availability was still inconsistent, but they were fast, they were young, they were tough, and they were smart. They posted the first winning season since the franchise's inception and ended the season with the third best record in the Western Conference. Their success was due in no small part to their home court advantage where they went 45-6 and six and ignited a frenzy that would be remembered as Blazer Mania. Starting that season, the Portland Trailblazers sold out every home game for the next 18 years. The Blazers made their playoff debut against the Chicago Bulls, and for the first time in the NBA, the world saw Bill Walton. The guy who was going to assume his place next to Russell, Wilt, and Kareem on the Mount Rushmore of centers. Of the three, his closest comparison was Russell. His offensive numbers weren't usually eye-popping, at least not in volume. Instead, he was a cerebral superstar, a game-changing defender who sought the highest form of basketball. He had brilliant court vision and awareness, and is often cited as one of, if not the, best passing big men of all time. He was constantly surveying the court from the post, hitting cutters in stride, and advancing the ball at breakneck pace with his signature outlet passes. He was a great leader. He loved being part of a team, loved getting the ball to his teammates and seeing them succeed. And he was still four or five inches taller than Russell, with a much higher aptitude for scoring, especially down the stretch and on the biggest stages. He had surprising range on his jump shot, soft touch around the basket, and used his imposing physicality to great effect. The Blazers beat the Bulls and Hall of Fame center Artis Gilmore two games to one. In the next round, they beat the Denver Nuggets and Hall of Fame center Dan Issel four games to two. And in the Western Conference Finals, against none other than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the Los Angeles Lakers, they won four games to zero. A clean sweep of the team with the best record in the league and the guy with the most MVPs in NBA history. All of a sudden, this upstart Cinderella Trailblazer team found themselves in the NBA Finals, facing the Philadelphia 76ers and the face of basketball, Dr. J. The Sixers were loaded with guys like Doug Collins, George McGinnis, and Daryl Dawkins, but it was Julius Irving who represented the sport of round ball to the world. The Blazers didn't care. Despite falling into an 0-2 hole out of the gate, a series deficit that had only been overcome once before in the finals, the Trailblazers won the next four games in a row to secure their first and still their only championship. They won game six in front of the Portland faithful with Walton submitting a masterpiece. 20 points, 23 rebounds, seven assists, and eight blocks. Blazer Mania peaked with a sweaty, delirious Bill Walton tossing his jersey into the crowd and wading through the mob like he'd been transported right into the middle of another Grateful Dead concert. He was named the finals MVP for the youngest team to ever win an NBA title, with Dr. Jack saying, I've never coached a better player, I've never coached a better competitor, and I've never coached a better person than Bill Walton. The team relished the offseason and returned for the 78 campaign, determined to prove that they were not some fluke, some team that had gotten hot at the right time. And they did. They were tearing through the regular season. And by the 60 game mark, the Blazers were 50 and 10. At that point, they were on pace to possibly contend with the 72 Lakers for the best record in history. Bob Ryan, maybe the most influential basketball writer ever, who started covering the game in 1969, still maintains that if he could have one center on his best day to play for the fate of humanity, he would take this version of Bill Walton. Yet again, Bill Walton was a part of something special. He'd created something special, his own basketball nirvana. 
and then he got hurt. It was his foot. The thing is, human beings aren't really meant to be seven foot three. And they aren't really meant to be seven foot three, running miles and miles, jumping up and down, taking abuse and punishment from other world-class athletes for two hours a night, 82 games a year. His body just couldn't take it. Although he missed the rest of the regular season, he was still awarded the MVP for his performance. Insane to think about, considering he only played two-thirds of the season in a league with a prime Kareem and a contending Julius Irving. When the playoffs began, the Blazers had secured the one seed, but had only won eight games since Walton was injured. He mustered all the strength he had to play in the team's first game against the Seattle Supersonics, but was overcome by the pain in the locker room afterward. Before game two, Walton knew he couldn't play. The team doctor convinced him to take an injection in his leg to mitigate the pain. He spent 15 unproductive minutes in the game, running around on a foot he couldn't feel at all. After the game, x-rays revealed that he had shattered the navicular bone in his foot in half. In that instant, he lost every bit of trust that he had in the Portland Trail Blazers and every ounce of self-respect that he had for himself. The team played the rest of the series without him, losing in six games. Bill Walton never played for the Portland Trail Blazers again. That's it. That's all we have of prime Bill Walton. About 85 games of nothing but dominance. A championship, a finals MVP, and a regular season MVP. In those 85 games, the Trailblazers were 70 and 15. He sat out the entire 79 campaign demanding a trade. He got his wish and was traded to the newly relocated San Diego Clippers. He'd be playing in his beloved hometown. He had undergone all kinds of surgeries, removing bone spurs and even lowering the arch of his foot in the hopes of preventing injuries. None of it worked. Injury after injury, surgery after surgery, setback after setback, year after year. In his five seasons with the Clippers, Walton appeared in only 169 of a possible 492 games. With all that time spent in hospital beds and waiting rooms, he had nothing but time to think about what had been, what could have been, and what he'd lost. When the team relocated to Los Angeles before the 1985 season, Walton felt like he'd failed his hometown. The fact that his injuries had become so severe that there was talk of a permanent limp, lifelong pain, and even possible amputation did nothing to ease his guilt. The Clippers had left San Diego and it was his fault. He decided to cut bait with the Clippers after 85. He was now nearly 10 years removed from his championship prime and knew that his chance of leading a team were over. Now, he just wanted one more chance. He wanted that feeling of nirvana, of being a part of something special, one last time. So who do you call in the mid 80s if you wanna be a part of a special basketball team? You call the Los Angeles Lakers, and you call the Boston Celtics. Which is exactly what Bill Walton did. He called the defending champion Lakers, but general manager Jerry West was wary of bringing in a player with the kind of baggage that hung on Walton. They were out. And so Bill rang up the Celtics. In fact, he called Red Arback himself. And it just so happened that at that time, Larry Bird was sitting in Red's office. Red ran the idea by Larry, who knew that the team needed more front court depth to throw at Kareem and give Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale some rest during games. Larry signed off, so Red made it happen. Bill Walton was now a Celtic. In name, at least. Before he could play, he still needed to pass a physical that he knew he had no chance at. While Walton sat in Massachusetts General Hospital, he heard the doctors whispering to each other about his horrendous x-rays. Walton describes the scene in his autobiography, saying, All of a sudden, Red burst through the double swinging doors, smoking his cigar, in the hospital. He looked around, perplexed. He bellowed, Who are you guys, and what are you doing with my player? The doctors covered their mouths with their cupped hands and murmured while drawing attention to the x-rays on the screens. Red, look at his feet. Look at his face. There's no way we can pass this guy. Red waved his arms, signaling for silence. Then he walked over to me, still on the table. 
Looking down at me, he said quietly, Walton, can you play? I looked up at him with the sad, sorrowful, but hopeful eyes of a man who just wants another chance in life. And I said softly, Red, I think I can. Red stepped back, taking it all in. He took a huge drag on his cigar. He held his breath for a seeming eternity. And when he finally did exhale, I swear the smoke was green and that there were shamrocks and leprechauns floating in it up against the fluorescent lights. Red's face went from concern and uncertainty to a cherubic smile as he proudly declared, He's fine. He passes. Let's go. We've got a game. It was official. Bill Walton was a Celtic. As much faith as Red had in him, though, Everyone knew that things could collapse in an instant. Walton had gotten his chance, but would his body let him have this one last ride? He would be coming off the bench, but he hadn't once played more than 67 games in a season. Including the playoffs, the 1986 Boston Celtics played in 100 games. Bill Walton played in 96 of them. It was magnificent. Though Walton's body had been broken down, his mind still ran at a million miles an hour, and his extraordinary court vision was right at home on perhaps the best passing team ever. He meshed wonderfully with the team, defended at an absurdly high level, and found a kindred spirit in Larry Bird. For the first time in either's career, they were playing alongside a fellow basketball savant. Bird really seemed to savor the moments when Walton would check in and the two would operate on some unknowable next level. The whole team loved Walton, and he loved them back. Especially Bird. Walton was in awe at Larry's abilities and could never spend enough time around him soaking that energy up. When the Celtics were on a road trip in Indiana playing the Pacers, Walton lobbied head coach Casey Jones to grant them an extra day off so that he could accompany Bird on a trip back to Bird's hometown of French Lick, Indiana. When they got to his mother's house, Walton pestered Georgia Bird with all kinds of questions. This is the house Larry grew up in? Wow. Is that the dirt driveway that he first shot hoops on? Wow. Walton asked Georgia Bird for a mason jar, walked out onto Larry Bird's childhood dirt court, and filled the jar with that special French lick Larry Bird dirt. For the rest of the season, he kept it in his game bag, and every time that Bill felt like his luck might turn, like his curse might be lingering, he would pull out that jar and rub on a little Larry Bird dirt. After the season, he took the last bit and sprinkled it on his own childhood court in his parents' backyard in San Diego. It worked. For all of his contributions off the bench, Bill Walton was named the sixth man of the year, the best reserve in all of basketball. That season, the Boston Celtics won 67 games in the NBA championship. They lost just one home game all year, when the conversation of the best basketball team ever gets brought up, the 1986 Celtics seem to come up more than all the rest. The whole time, all season long, Bill Walton relished it. He was back, back with the guys, back on a winner, back in the middle of something truly special. None of it was lost on him. He knew that this was the time that they would be asked about for the rest of their lives. And that was it. He suffered an injury the next season and only played in 10 regular season games. He came back for the playoffs, averaging just eight minutes a game as the Celtics lost to the Lakers in the finals. He had squeezed out every ounce of luck that he had left in that one last miraculous season. That is the story of Bill Walton. Incredible that a player could accomplish so much when he only played about six seasons worth of games in a 14-year career. It leaves us wondering what if? What could the story of Bill Walton have been? Instead, we'll have to settle for this one. The one where Bill Walton goes down as arguably the greatest college basketball player ever, achieves a professional peak that stands among the best in history, and finds redemption on a pivotal piece on perhaps the finest basketball team to ever play. I don't know about you, but I like that story. After the Celtics won the championship in game six of the finals, they partied. But Larry's days of long nights were behind him. 
He just wanted some sleep. Late that night, the doorbell rang. Larry's wife went down to answer it, coming back to tell Larry that Bill Walton was waiting at the door. And he was. All seven foot three of him standing there with a bottle of wild turkey, urging his teammate to come out for just a bit longer. Larry declined. And so, rather than be anywhere in the world that Larry Bird wasn't, Bill Walton sat in Bird's kitchen, drinking his bourbon, listening to the Grateful Dead, and praying, thanking the universe that he had been allowed one more chance, all night long. The next morning, Larry thought that he might have dreamed that Walton had shown up. He went downstairs to find Walton, still drinking, still listening to music. Bill, Larry asked, didn't you sleep? Larry, Walton replied, how can I sleep? We are world champions. Thank you.